Atomic Heart broke my heart. I mean, crispy critters. What happened? Unlike many in the gaming community, to me, Atomic Heart being extremely underwhelming did not come as a massive surprise. I have to give credit to Munfish as it was their first ever game, but this was a great example of perfect pre-launch marketing. The trailers leading up to Atomic Heart's release were almost exclusively made of non-dialogue cinematics and boss fights, which were two of the very few redeeming qualities to this game. The story, set in the 1950s, pits you as Agent P3 as you travel through the utopian facility 3826 in a post World War II victorious Soviet Union, which, upon arrival, gets overrun by hacked human-controlled civilian robots gone hostile. Altogether, the story is decent, albeit confusing, and ended horrifically, but the absolutely insufferable dialogue and characterization of specifically Agent P3 combined with the lifeless voice acting completely removed any interest in the story for me, with my focus instead shifting to how much longer I had left in the full playthrough I was following before I could finish and immediately uninstall after the credits rolled. The combat was fine and luckily the boss fights I'd go as far as to say were good, but even with these positives, nothing can redeem this game for me. But for the sake of the video, I'm glad the bosses were once again quite fun. For note, about half these bosses I fought on Peaceful Adam and the other half on Local Malfunction, this game's version of easy and medium difficulty. I found that the bosses were extremely unbalanced, and not just each boss having vastly different amounts of health individually, but in most cases, the same boss having literally 5 to 6 times as much or less health on separate difficulties. Also for note, I opted on not using the fat boy so as to get a fair experience with each fight. Atomic Heart was fucking bad, but at least the boss fights were pretty damn good relative to the dumpster fire of a game they exist in. Let's get into the ranking. First boss, worst boss. Welcome to the life of a mini-boss. As time's gone on, Alex and I have begun to veer away from counting mini-bosses due to 1. their insignificance, 2. generally uninteresting design and scripting potential, 3. pointless place in the video, and 4. the 4 weeks we spent making a 113 boss Elden Ring ranking we could have made in 1 week just counting the main fights. Why did we do that? I don't know. This is a rare break from the trend, however, mainly due to the sheer number of comments we'd get over not counting this mustachioed animatronic. The Vov A6 CH Lab Tech is an enhanced variant of the base collective robot with a built-in laser. That's it. You'd think the Elite class would have gotten like a handlebar or something. Damn. Hell yeah, Pleush was the first boss shown off way back in 2020, and it holds up fairly well three years onwards. The Pleush is a polymer muscle endoskeleton, and like you'd expect of... a polymer muscle endoskeleton, it's pretty unclear what's going on, ever. This is my biggest problem with it, although his damage output is extremely small, so I can give it a pass. Pleush's moveset is pretty basic and doesn't go beyond lunges and other generic melee attacks. As a recurring boss, I'm not shocked, but wish that maybe it had a quick time finisher instead of that randomly occurring quick time that exists to waste your time. Pleush is alright, just forgettable compared to other bosses higher on the list. Fuck, this fight is bad, man. More in an overall existence sense than the fight itself being bad. As you'll come to see, Left is actually one of this game's better bosses. But taking the same boss from earlier, cloning it and making one of the clones basically unhittable, meaning it's just the exact same boss fight from 15 minutes earlier but with double the amount of things happening at the same time, keep in mind you're in a first person POV, was a horrific and lazy design choice. Trying to keep track of what's going on is like being in a room with strobe lights and fighting a ninja with one eye blind. My brain just went into sensory overload after like 30 seconds of non-stop knockdown animations. Also to my knowledge, left and right have no moveset differences aside from right's marble ball attack and, once again, her staying infinitely in air. And also, left is exactly as you dispatched her like 2 minutes before the hour-long elevator ride up to Shechenov's office, so ultimately the twins being here isn't out of purely poor mechanical design, more an inherently lazy existence as their own boss. Out of the 9 or 10 times I've ever jokingly pretended to speak Russian in my life, something similar sounding to Belyash had to have come out. 
It's a pastry also, a Belyash. Anyways, the MA9 Belyash closes out what most people consider to be the second quarter of the game's narrative, just before you enter the theater to capture Petrov. Like Pliush, this is another fight that's horrendously balanced, so I fought it on Peaceful Adam where it feels much more fair. The Belyash moves similar to a dog, and its moveset is almost entirely melee. This fight is heavy on dodging and then firing after, instead of generally being on the offensive. A lot of Belyash's attacks are cinematic, like the rock throw and all the AoEs, which I can commend, and the arena is really well sized and even has a death star in it, or something. Cool. The second phase kicks off with Belyash going into a second gear, literally. He starts spinning his head until it ignites, and begins lashing out fire-based attacks that leave the grassy field charred afterwards. This phase fucking kicks ass. Belyash looks visually cooler, his attacks have more spectacle, and the whole place is burning down around you. Belyash is a really fun boss that's only in the lower half due to really a lack of moveset variety. Sexual robot, sexual robot, whatever man, I go to college and am like pretty successful on Tinder and stuff, so in all honesty these robots never caught my attention much. Still, Just Left on her own is significantly more fun than when fought alongside her twin. Left has an extremely varied moveset of both melee and energized attacks as well as special moves like the laser grid. Munfish were an animation studio before making Atomic Heart and it shows most in the fluid movement of Left. She moves so gracefully like the ballerina she is, but also with a vicious speed and aggression as you'd expect of a robot designed to be an elite bodyguard. As well, her voice changes from the gentle laughs you'd heard in the first few appearances she'd made earlier to a snarl or a hiss, like a rabid dog, which added a lot of atmosphere. With her massive moveset variety, cinematic spectacle, and alright soundtrack, Left is the much better twin. Dewdrop may have my favorite and maybe PETA's least favorite introduction cutscene of any boss in the game, and the fight that follows is a great display of the robot's abilities. Dewdrop's headlining mechanic is its extremely powerful laser, and it also has 8 limbs that it uses in melee. One thing I really like about the larger scale robot bosses in Atomic Heart is their movement. Dewdrop, like almost all the others, is constantly on the move and varies in how he gets from point A to point B. Sometimes it'll roll, sometimes it'll jump, and other times it'll just stay in place and unleash a heavy laser attack. Dewdrop's moveset is also extremely varied for a testicle on stilts, with a mix of horizontal and vertical lasers, stumps, and a second phase where polymer grows from its inside which in itself gives Dewdrop an entirely new moveset. It's also really neat that depending on where you are relative to Dewdrop, it has corresponding attacks with the laser, the most noticeable one being that when you're under it, it eventually fires off directly at you by straightening out its limbs so it can aim at where you are. And while almost all of Dewdrop's attacks I'd say are fair, the one polymer attack that has you stuck in a walled off alley as the robot does its best Orphan of Koss reenactment and sputters out balls of goo was pretty fucking bad. You can't really do anything when you're stuck in there, but otherwise the second phase was great overall. Dewdrop is extremely engaging and has my favorite physical design of any boss, rightfully earning its number 3 spot on this list. Natasha is this game's sleeper baddie, I love her. The large framed NAT256 Natasha is a great boss. While it's extremely simple compared to the past few bosses on this list, that's what makes her stand out. I feel like some of Atomic Heart's bosses were overcomplicated or had too much movement to be comprehensible in the moment, whereas Natasha, due to her large size and telegraphed but still deceptively quick attacks, is the opposite. I'd say she's like Smo from Dark Souls by comparison in that regard, but what holds her back from being number one is the minimal changes made in her second phase that makes the fight drag out a bit. Natasha's base moveset is a missile launch, the arm extension attack, and other miscellaneous stomps. The second phase brings in a Dancer of the Boreal Valley-esque spinning cyclone as well as homing bombs, but these are very avoidable so don't feel significant at all. And that's the fight in its entirety. The soundtrack that accompanies this fight was pretty interesting, and once again the animation of her movements were beautiful to look at, but due to having almost no changes throughout the fight, NAT256 Natasha falls just short of being number one. I'm really interested to see other people's rankings of Atomic Heart's bosses, as this game is extremely subjective in gameplay approach, and as such, I wouldn't be surprised to see some people rank Hedgy in the lower half of the bosses. But for me, the Hog 7 Hedgy was by far the game's best single combat sequence, and it all starts with its physical design. The initial cutscene on the train where Hedgy knocks the train down serves as a teaser for what's to come, and my god did they make Hedgy look great. 
The Hedgy is a ball-shaped robot with chambers storing limbs, turrets, and battery packs that open and close as the robot sees fit in combat. This design allows for super engaging gameplay, as Hedgy is constantly rolling around, jumping, and stabbing at you. Hedgy also uses his non-combat modes to fight as well. In Tumbleweed mode, he can move up to speeds of 30 miles an hour, however, you can use this to your advantage. The arena is loaded with towers you can use shock to reveal that if Hedgy rolls into, deal massive damage and also momentarily stun him, opening his batteries to even more damage. Aside from this bit of environmental design, every minute or so, Hedgy will tire out and stop moving altogether to recharge and open its energy batteries which you then blow up to deal damage. As the fight progresses, he gets more and more intense and even gains a suction attack that kills you on impact, an awesome special move that makes this fight stand out even more. The Hog 7 Hedgy is Atomic Heart's most experimental, unique, and engaging boss, by far the most thrilling combat sequence in the game and one of the better bosses in a first-person shooter I've fought. Thanks so much for watching, and we hope you enjoyed. I forgot to say it in the introduction, so I'll say it now. Thank you so much to Jack Allen, Aaron Trong, Tintanibulations, Chelsea White, and Not A Charge Shot for being such incredible patrons. Thanks, all love, even with Sonic 06, which will happen eventually. Make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't, and otherwise be sure to check in weekly for new uploads. That's all for now. Deuces.